the not having a voice part is because I was with kindergartners through fourth grade all day long. Fabulous. We were doing workshops with other papers and they were wonderful at Wilson Elementary, which is an arts integration school. Fabulous place. Most people sitting here are a little too old to enroll, and I'm sorry. <laughs> So I, I want to tell you a little bit about myself and a little bit about my art, and um, I, I uh, hope it will make your experience of viewing my work um, even more engaging than it might otherwise have been. What you see in front of you, um, of course, Lady Liberty. I uh, and my refugee family of five came to the U.S. in 1949. And we lived with a sponsoring family in Lorain, Ohio for about a year. And then in 1950, we had the good fortune of coming to Oklahoma City. And we were embraced by a wonderful community here. My mother, um, a painter, painted a mural in Wilson Elementary. And now I'm an artist, a different kind of artist, but now here I am today. But there's something else about this, not just that we spent some days on Ellis Island, but that is one of the most miraculous textiles, and textiles are my background. You wouldn't think of that, but it's basically a net, a grid, and I'm very um, interested in the relationship of textiles to architecture and how we make things, how we build things. And then you see me sitting on a pile of rope, in a little place I started that was an art center, but it, it was like a tenth of what's, a, a hundredth of what's here. This place is so magnificent, I just love it. And um, when I read Bringing Art to Life, I thought, oh, this is my kind of place. I looked it up online and found that phrase, and I thought, that's just wonderful. I'm so pleased to be back here in Oklahoma City. It means so much to me. So you may be wondering, squib? What's a squib? A squib is a small firework that burns with a hissing sound before exploding a small firecracker. I hope you have some of those feelings when you go through the exhibit, but maybe, maybe a little less so. Uh, a squib is also a miniature explosive device that it's used for all kinds of industries and things, military applications too. But I am personally an anti-militarist, having been born in a war in Europe gone to school in Berkeley in a wartime, and here we are again. So um, that was interesting to me. Also on Twitter, it's a quick little humorous writing or speech, a short news item of specialty. I thought that was interesting. A shard of remnant. Some of my work feels like that, a piece of something bigger. And so I like that word. And a cipher, a cipher text is an encoded text. It's um, a version of a message um, or text that is like a, a cryptogram. And I hope you also are puzzled by some of the things that you see. Oh, so there I am sitting on a, a pile of rope. And um, the whole notion about spinning a strand is so miraculous that in the Andes, um, people spun strands, made rope, and um, Francisco Pizarro was able to take cannons and horses across these rope bridges um, to the detriment of the people there, of course, because they, they were conquered. Um, but it's a pretty miraculous thing that can happen with a spun strand. And without a spun strand, we would not have the Golden Gate Bridge that we look out at every day. It is, um, it is a funneling of a small strands. It, it has thousands of tiny wires that are spun. And because of that, they can move. So they won't crash. They won't shatter. And also, enormous strength because they're all pulling against each other. So much stronger than a big fat single strand. So it's very interesting what textiles have brought to us. Uh, so, of course, I had to fiddle around with making strands. Uh, I was invited to do a piece in a, a, oops, 
I don't know what happened here. We'll go there. Whoops. Oh, let's see. Oh. I hope you like those images. We might be going over there several times. I was invited to Manchester, England uh, for an international landscape and sculpture show. And the last mills in Manchester were closed in the late 70s. So that got me kind of thinking about strands again. And we were still throwing paper, waste paper out. So when you print, there are these big rolls of paper and you do a printing run. And if you have to stop with that much still on the roll, you cannot start a new one because it goes away like that and then you have to get a new roll and stop the presses, etc. So there was a lot of paper being thrown out into landfill. Now I think we recycle as much paper as we possibly can. And that's the BBC trying to figure out what's happening in the bottom of the garden. I also, early on, really enjoyed reading. And that kind of got me into what my later work was. But of course, I had to weave strands. So I wove a lot of strands, and I was fortunate enough to be um, commissioned by the federal government to make a large piece uh, for the Social Security building in Richmond, California. Those are all basically long strands that I wove on a loom. But loom weaving is very exciting in other ways. Without looming, loom weaving, we would not have computers today. The punch cards of looms is what was the beginning of understanding the X and the O, which resulted in our computers. So now vault ahead, and here we are with all our technical devices. But weaving is a wonderful thing. And um, I went outside in the California landscape and, and did some sort of uh, darning of the landscape. And I wanted to show you that because I'll be talking a little bit about some other work that I do that is landscape oriented. But also I want to say that living in California, which was from about um, fourth grade on, fourth or fifth, one of the things that touched me very deeply was the artistry and the creativity of the Native Americans in California. And that began having a huge impact on me. And look at this miraculous thing being built. I think Buckminster Fuller, who made this for the Montreal Fair in the year that I started at UC Berkeley, must have loved baskets and thought, I'll just turn one upside down. It's a pretty amazing piece because on the far, far left, you see a human being sitting. So th this is quite a big basket. But this is Washington Square Park, where we live, in North Beach, in San Francisco. And a little bit earlier, somebody who was interested in Buckminster Fuller's geodesic dome idea uh, put a dome there, but he might have been involved because he was at Berkeley for a little while before before I got there. So that's that happened in my name. Another beautiful basket upside down. And so of course I had to try what Buckminster Fuller was working with, which is um, structures based on triangles. And, and then the idea that you can make triangles form a dome, a curved surface, I thought was just fascinating. There's more about him, you can look him up. And I am interested in what happens as I build things. So, well, the background here is that I was um, selected to be the chair of the art department in UC Davis, where I was a professor for a long time. And the first thing I started making was a no. I thought, that's weird. But <laughs> while, I was, <laughs> while I was trying to figure out the sizes, I made several in cardboard. And as I put them on top of each other, I thought, what an interesting geometric arrangement this is. And how it spirals as it got smaller as a shape are just fascinating. I've not done anything with that tower of ends, but maybe one day. And then when I stepped down, guess what I made? <laughs> a little prickly, yes, because yes is not always easy. And I've made a, a few, a very few, quite larger pieces. Um, this was for an exhibition in Lausanne, Switzerland. And um, you see the small maquette in the corner. And then I call this that word. And it was built over a metal substructure. Of course, it was big, and there was a deadline. So all my artist friends showed up uh, on various days to help me get to the end. And 
get it shipped off. And it was made out of mostly orchard prunings from up and down California. I would drive from San Francisco to UC Davis, which was about an hour and 20 minutes, an hour and a half north of San Francisco. And it was really messy, dirty, hot, dusty work. But Perrielas came along. So I got to looking much better when I was out there. <laughs> but this is what happens in our agricultural area. It was like driving by an art supply store and seeing it on fire. And the fires in California, you've been reading about them, they're devastating and they're getting worse. Um, and so I didn't make a huge dent in that, but a lot of what I was hoping was that people would look at these hardwoods in a new way. They are spectacular. Walnut, peach, almond, apricot, really amazing, beautiful woods. So anyone here, and I know there are a lot of creative people in this audience, please think about those branches. And then, of course, uh, my husband's very supportive, so he got me my own, um, uh, <laughs> all those saws that scare me to death. <laughs> and I love this, excuse me, Harold, while I go slip into something more comfortable. And very often, I did arrive home from the UC <laughs> with my car festoon. I'm going to keep up with, see if there's anything that I want to tell you. But oh, there are wood collectors in the world who are way beyond anything I can organize on top of my car. Uh, this is in India where I spent um, postgraduate work in a program after I finished my graduate studies. And brilliantly, beautifully stacked wood. Probably for burning purposes, but extraordinarily um, beautiful sculpture at this stage. And Basketry then became one way that I learned about building things, and this is called eternal vigilance. Now, eternal vigilance, uh, I borrowed from, yes, often said Thomas Jefferson, but Philpott Curran, John Philpott Curran's 1790 speech for the Lord Mayor of Dublin regarding preserving liberty. But I used it thinking about preserving nature and our environment. And there is a, um, an art writer, Susie Gablick, who in a 1991 book um, called The Reenchantment of Art had a chapter heading I really love, Making Art as if the World Mattered. And I feel as if that's what is happening here when we bring art to life. It's really important to human beings and important to our well-being. And so I got very busy collecting wood and bending it and making basketry. Um, on, on the left is a piece that is in the Paisley Museum in Scotland. And on the right, um, one that is made out of um, London plane tree, which I bend before it dries up. But my basketry never held anything. Traditionally, baskets were for real important purposes. <laughs> But I used, I used what I learned to be able to structure various kinds of things. I was invited to Austria uh, to be in a land art exhibition in an organic valley. So with um, the branches that I could collect there from the farmers and the orchards, um, I, made, I made a no, but I made a subtle no. The N is lying down. I thought the O was okay. O, okay. Um, because a very, very right-wing um, neo-Nazi guy had just gotten a position in pretty high government in one of the um, counties of Austria. And um, artists for this exhibit almost all decided not to do it. But then uh, talking to curators and others, they said, oh, no, no, no. He does not like modern art. And, and generally, the party doesn't like modern art. So we all decided to participate. But I also loved how they helped get the piece out into the landscape with their tractor. And so I wanted to tell you a little bit about other ways that I do work. There you saw a big circle on the ground, a big piece of paper. But sometimes I build a, a template, like in this case. 
And then I can use that template for other pieces. This is um, Mandarin Orange. Um, and this is in the collection of Francis and Eleanor Coppola. But there are also really weird ways I make things. I would say, well, that's maybe a little bit weird over there, and a couple of other pieces you could put in that category. I happen to have um, a, a traffic cone, and I liked it. And so I started taking apple wood and somehow organizing it on top of this. Um, and, and sometimes, sometimes I really don't know how these things happen. And this was the result. Now again, my, my fascination with my own mm, kind of oddity is the inside of this is the color of the traffic cone. Not on purpose, but I guess I really love that traffic cone. <laughs> and my work does address the core issues at the interface of gender politics and contemporary <laughs> basket weaving. I'm glad there are some men involved. Because this piece, can you read what it spells? The top is an L. And there's a G and an A. So it's either lag or gal. And I put those two together. The last few years of my life at the university was spent trying to diversify and create gender equity in the faculty hires at UC Davis. And we did get an article in the New York Times that said, equity, gender equity, and diversity at the universities of California is lagging. <laughs> so, I hate to say that. I'm really sorry to say that, but we're doing much better now. We worked on it very hard for several years, had hearings in the legislature, and things are much better. And things are moving along. I want to talk about this because this is really deeply important to me. But before, I want to suggest that you look online for something called 208 Years Until Gender Equity. Melinda Gates from the Gates Foundation. <laughs> I see some people know it already. Very funny and very depressing. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, when the Iraq War started in 2003 in the spring, I was really, really upset because I opened our newspaper and this is what I saw and what it made me think of was my family. Three little kids trying to get away from the violence and the horror. And I must say, I really, I really am an anti-militarist. I, I would love it if we didn't have wars. So I started making the word war and the first one was for an exhibit I was invited to in Poland. And lo and behold, that man who's giving me an award, I got an award for, for my word, war, <laughs> that's surprising. Um, that's Christopher Hill, who became the ambassador. He was the ambassador in Poland at the time, and became the ambassador to Iraq later. So it kind of fit with what happened with his career path. And I did make many, uh, I think four, four or five, the word war in different ways. Um, maybe just trying to purge my um, my difficulty with the problems that it causes. Um, and then it was interesting to me that anagrammatically, the word war all kind of means the same thing. I thought that was fascinating. And there are little G.I. Joes in this. I said, really? <laughs> Actually, the, the green and black one is uh, on a living room wall in New York. So, I mean, some people responded in that way. For some reason, I began with the A. And I was just about finishing the A when he called me up and he said, oh, Ginge, I don't think I can live with the word war on my wall. I think he was reading all those newspaper articles. So we talked and talked, and finally I thought, okay, Pax, I like that. The Roman goddess of peace. That was a good word. That's Manzanita, by the way. Then a similar thing happened. Oh, you know what? I didn't put my timer on. Can somebody stop me when I just go on and on and on? Um, I like to put my timer on so I don't um, put you to sleep with my um, talking about my work because I could go on and on and on about it. Um, some people in the financial industries came to me and said, oh, we love a piece of yours. And I said, oh, great. Then they said, come look at our collection. So I said, great. 
and we promote the collection. See, we love to collect art about money. <laughs> I'm not at that end of money. <laughs> and I didn't know what to say. Oh, what? But some of the works were really magnificent. So I thought about it, thought about it. And then I realized that one of the other things that was so disturbing to me was the treasury, not of the loss of lives, colossal, but also our treasury. And now, I read an article recently that we're almost at six trillion on the wars, all these wars in the Middle East. That is horrendous, what we could do with that. We could have a lot of art spaces for that. Um, so I went ahead and I made, I made those two pieces. There are G.I. Joe's and the dollar sign, and, and the, the cent sign is very, very prickly. <laughs> and this is how I sometimes develop work and, and a number of those, because I got into then a currency series. And I have an overhead projector, bought it for $10 because nobody wants them anymore. It's fabulous. <laughs> And this is how, um, after I, I put it on the wall, I cut a paper pattern, then I make a cardboard box, and it's a really nice way to get a clean edge. And so this is the Euro, and <laughs> there are a few soldiers hanging out in that. <laughs> and it turned out in 2010, um, India, thinking that their economy was strong and robust, wanted their own symbol, because the dollar sign and the Euro, the Euro came in 1996. And you see it pop up. If you Google international currencies, the euro, the dollar sign, the yen, the yuan are right there. And so they wanted a symbol for the rupee because it was RS, rupees or R, and they wanted their own. So Mr. Kumar designed this. You can see how happy he is, and he did a beautiful job. That, that figure almost makes the sound of R in Hindi. So he, he came up with some, and I made a bed of nails, figure that. So there's my whole series. On the far right, you'll see that Turkey will not be outdone. And in 2011, a committee in Turkey came up with a symbol for Turkey. If you Google international currencies now, you get, you get the, the uh, rupee popping up right away. Um, but um, Turkey's sometimes. But it was interesting. And then I started thinking about it, and I thought, these monetary symbols are part of our universal language over borders. If you have a dollar sign or a euro sign, there are people all over the world who know what that is. And then I thought, how interesting that we have some shapes that can speak to people over over language, you don't need the language. And also stop signs now. And, and there are a number of, an arrow. Oh, a little backstory. Somebody several years before I made this piece gave me a bunch of doll hands. I don't know, I fell in love with them. And somehow they seem just right. I call this piece Reach. So there's, a, there's a, um, an arrow, and in the background, one of my basketry pieces. True North. So I was invited to Bulgaria to do an outdoor piece, and that was in 2005. And I thought, after the Soviet Union, the Iron Curtain disappeared, these countries that were struggling so under the Soviet regime were coming up, and, and, and it wasn't easy. Um, economic difficulties, political difficulties. And so I thought an arrow going up into the sky would be the right thing. Um, the people in the town where we were um, seemed very interested. The kids helped, and then at the end, I got a lot of help putting it up. It was great fun. It goes from natural branches to recycled, um, small-scale wood from buildings that have been torn down. And I do work with commercial wood sometimes. Um, this is a question mark. Again, a symbol that is recognized very easily all over the place. And people can even communicate with these symbols and signs. Oh, let's see what's happening. OK, there. Oh, I know what's happening. OK. But anyway, some GI Joes landed in those two. And the, the question mark turned into a devil here, devil in the details. Um, I was asked to make a question mark for the um, art embassies in um, 
the ambassador's residence in Poland, in Warsaw, and this piece uh, was made for that and ended up in the new Kosovo embassy on a permanent basis now. And you see those little soldiers? They just keep cropping up. But I also began to love the ampersand. It's a connector. It's that more is coming. It's, um, it's the final, what is it, the 26th letter in the alphabet, it turns out. Then someone told me that it's because kids were citing, were saying A, B, C, D, E, and by the time they got to X, Y, Z, there was a and, 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 and so it's and, per se, and, which if you're tired and slur it, ended up being ampersand. And that's, word, word detectives said that that was a true story, but the ampersands are beautiful. I think by the time the people who designed fonts got to that last one, they said, let's have a good time now. <laughs> and I find them on letters, I find them in the newspaper, I find them all over the place. And uh, the Oma Museum um, commissioned one for me, and this is, this is theirs. Um, and this one was um, in an art and embassy exhibition um, in NATO. Uh, for the ambassador, Evo Dalder, um, and it's a kind of rough one because I got it off a business card, and the business card was so poorly printed that it was kind of fuzzy around the edges. Then it turned out I really liked the fuzzy edges, so we made it fuzzy. And every now and then I have um, people who want to come hang out with me and get involved in what I do, so um, here are two who are helping me. And the funny thing is it's Mo and Bo. <laughs> They're really their names. Um, the um, ambassador and his wife ended up watching this piece in their home when they left, which was lovely. Sometimes these templates are very big. This is a, a Manzanita um, Q. Now, a diacritical mark is, is like an A. An A can stand by itself and we know what it is, uh, especially if you get one at school. And the Q is a little bit like that. Headquarters is HQ. Uh, a Q by itself often means a question, or queer. We, we give it these kinds of meanings, and so here is a letter all by itself that can mean so much. And, and I'm really interested in how we develop these shapes, uh, but there are languages where the shapes are full words. This is um, Farsi, this is the Persian language, 2009. Uh, Ahmadinejad, it said that he stole the election, and so the students had big signs that said, where is my vote? It's so beautiful, I thought, you know, that is a good question. It's a question that arises constantly all over the world, and, and so I made this. It's mirrored. You can see my face down there in the bottom of the question mark. <laughs> my photographer was having a good time. Uh, but the, the, these are actual words, not, not letters. So I, I found that fascinating and, and would like to do more with that idea. Okay, learn, playing around with that. Uh, uh, art turned out to be rat on my table suddenly. <laughs> but this one is an interesting one. You, there are a few wireworks in this exhibition, but this one, the word ever I love, because in French, which I speak, is rev, and that's a dream. Dream ever. How can you not love that? And then, vere, as I was trying to learn Italian, that, that means truthfulness or truth, something like that, maybe in Latin. Um, and so I was working away, it's about this big, very long, strenuous thing to make, especially with the letters popping out. I showed it to a young friend from Mexico City, and suddenly it occurred to me there are four letters, but not four words. And she said, oh yes, there are four words. I said, what? She said, Edda, if you spell that Jewish word, that Hebrew word, in our English language, it's E-R-E-V, and it's something like Erev Tov, like, like the beginning of, of a holiday, and it's a greeting. I looked into it further, and it turns out it has something to do with woof and weft and weaving, and it has to do with interconnections. I thought, oh, and so I have a piece with four letters in four languages. And if anyone here can find any other three or four letter word 
in more than, in as many languages as there are letters, I will be eternally grateful. I haven't been able to come up with one yet. But I do like words, and I was invited to an airplane show, and, and this one is just little pins in the wall. It looked like you could blow it away, and, and I couldn't make an airplane, so I thought the word air, and that fits with my love of language. And this is more recent, this is called golf tees, T-E-A-S-E. -E. But it's fun to play around with what we can read and how we can read it. Can you read this? Doesn't take much to read letters, turns out. Okay, the first one is an N. Naturally. 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 That is it. But it's so interesting that a line or two. Oh, okay. Well, I want to talk about this too. So um, <laughs> these parents had, I think, a 10 or 11 year old who was having so much trouble. He was dyslexic and he, he couldn't write very well. And they put him, for some reason, in a Japanese immersion school. And because he was writing what is, I think, more like symbols than maybe the way we first created language and letters, he somehow was able to do this so much better. Anybody? I know there are some Japanese speakers in the audience. Um, but this, this, apparently, it's easy to read as Japanese, but difficult to read as English. So I am very interested in emblematic shapes. And this is a favorite of mine. Um, it is about 4,000 years old from the Colorado Plateau, maybe the Grand Canyon. Um, it's, I don't know, it's a toy. It's, it's a figure of some importance to a belief system. I don't know. Um, but I started then looking at my own pieces that I was working with. And I thought they're really fascinating shapes. And again, maybe people did look at sticks and say, okay, this stick means T, and this stick means H, and, and this scratch or whatever means. And, and maybe we built things out of our visual activity, which is maybe a little bit of why I believe that being creative and making art is so important. I think we think in a very different way when we are have our hands on things and, and making things. And then I got really interested in these sort of distorted, odd shapes. I used to cut those off, save the long, clean wands, and get rid of these, now I think, beautiful shapes. This is a fairly recent basket, about two feet high. And then I started looking at these pieces, and I thought, oh, it is like a symbol system. This is a pretty big piece. There you see me in my studio. And many people, actually, who have seen it thought it's a language system of some sort, or maybe I'm making up a language, which I would love to do, actually. So I was an artist in residence in Maine, and they had a place at Haystack Mountain School, and they had a place that they had just set up called the Fab Lab, and there are some around the country now. MIT, I think, started these. And the people there took a photo of, of that big piece that I gave them, and then they started cutting them out in all sorts of sizes. And you'll see one of those results here on the wall over there. And then we made a sphere out of it. This is Kenny Chung, who um, helped make little connectors on the ends of these pieces. And then they cut them out of cardboard, and so I, I made a kind of open, strange-looking basket with the cardboard. And you'll see there's some inspiration in this current exhibit that came from this wonderful piece. But all I can do is encourage you to make. Put your hands on things, be creative, make stuff, make the world better. Thank you. I think I talked too long. But otherwise, a couple of questions. Do you want to do that? Or people can do that with you after? Yes, um, in the back, if you wander through uh, the beautiful work area in this place where, where the um, student activities and workshops happen, they do wonderful work with, um, they call it their mentor program, and I was working with a group of students, and you saw that I love the strand, and I love rope making, 
So I decided, well, that might be an interesting thing for them because um, these days a lot of people wouldn't have done any spinning or any twisting of anything. And so um, do wander around and take a look because um, we got a lot of fabric and we got some Tyvek, Tyvek, whatever it's called, and, and some little stuff and some fuzzy stuff and we made small rope and big rope and strands and then by the end of the day everybody was so excited they just put them all together and it was a wonderful experience and and these were high school kids they were they were fabulous and, and they really got involved and and there are also some photographs which are great because I told you about Francisco Pizarro and so we we made these ropes and then we had people climb into them and see how strong they were. So you'll see a photo. Any other questions? Could have one or two. Otherwise, oh, one in the back. Yes. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for coming back to Oklahoma City, uh, especially during this period of time when we're celebrating the most of the My first grade. <laughs> and uh, I'm pretty sure that we'll be responsible for all of the <laughs>
Then take it out for a little bit, let the guys think that spring has come, and then put it back in for next. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for coming.